I would like to request all the uh, dignitaries, uh, our honorable speakers, to please come up onto the dais. Mr. Ajay Prakash Sahani, Secretary, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Ms. Devichani Ghosh. Mr. Ajit Mohan. Maria Luisa Martin. Mr. William Hiroyuki Saito. Mr. Prashant Roy. So, as I earlier mentioned, that the theme for this session is cyber growth, cyber for growth, creating a favorable policy environment for digital economy. We have on the desk Mr. Ajay Prakash Sahani, Secretary, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. He is an IS officer of Andhra Pradesh Cadre 84 batch. He has handled various assignments in the state of Andhra Pradesh, covering law and order, e-governance, and election, etc. He has spent more than 20 years in, organ in assignments relating to information technology, e-governance, and has led the formulation of innovative policies and implementation of several uh, major e-governance communications and broadband projects. Ms. Devjani Ghosh, former Managing Director, Intel South Asia. Uh, she is President Designate of uh, NASCOM. Prior to this, she served as Vice President of Sales and Marketing and uh, Managing Director of South Asia at uh, Intel Corporation. Ms. Ghosh will be the first woman president of NASCOM. Fortune India ranked her the 11th most powerful woman in business in India. Mr. Ajit Mohan, uh, he is CEO, Hotstar. Ajit Mohan leads Star India's digital business. Uh, in the last two years uh, at Star, he has launched and uh, grown two leading platforms, starsports.com and Hotstar, which has become India's leading OTT platform for professional content. Ms. Maria Luisa Martin, uh, Head of Data Protection Public Policy, Google Inc., uh, is a Spanish lawyer by the University of Zaragoza. Maria is uh, specialized in EU law. She has 14 years of public policy experience in Brussels. Uh, she also held various uh, positions at Time Warner and uh, post um, Volnet Brussels. And we have uh, Mr. William Hiroyuki Saito, a special advisor to government of Japan. Mr. William Saito is a lifelong entrepreneur, consultant, and security expert whom Nikki named one of the 100 most influential people for Japan. He is a global authority on information technology, entrepreneurship, and innovation, and has uh, developed a fingerprint recognition platform that has expanded to cover internet security. And this session is being moderated by Mr. Prashanto Roy. Uh, Prashanto Roy is the vice president of NESCOM uh, in New Delhi the Apex Body and Industry Association for India's $154 billion IT industry and related sectors. A former technology journalist, he was uh, president and chief editor at Cyber Media, India's largest technology publisher. So now I hand over the floor to the moderator, Mr. Prashant Roy. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, delighted to be on this session and thank you very much, uh, all of you who have braved the uh, post-lunch walk on this somewhat dusty path to be here. That is quite a filter, you know, post-lunch and a long walk and then 
you've done it, so I guess that's filtered it down to people who are deeply interested in the subject of creating a favorable policy uh, environment for the digital economy. Uh, it's, it's an exciting area because it is an exciting space. Uh, it's a very, very hot and happening space. Uh, it's a space where there are different uh, legs and different buckets of activity. Take digital payments, for example. It's been huge in India over the last 12 months or so. Uh, we had demonetization, but even before that, you had a lot of activity in digital payments. And this month, uh, suddenly there is a, you know, uh, one year down from demonetization, you've got this bunch of global players, you know, uh, uh, including uh, Google Tears and WhatsApp in payments and PayPal. So suddenly you don't have just, uh, uh, you know, a few players across four or five sectors who are dominating the market. So huge activity there. Uh, getting, the, getting a billion Indians online, I think that's one common thread we are going to try to look at how to make that happen. And, uh, you know, I'd like to, so I, what I'd like to do is structure this as interactively as possible. Uh, request uh, each uh, person, perhaps starting with you, Ajay, to give a very quick overview of uh, how to make this happen. How do you make, for example, access happen? So getting the next three, we have over a three, over maybe 300 million, 350 million people who use smartphones and broadband internet connections, and it's all mobile, all internet connectivity is mobile here. The next 300 million will be an interesting challenge because they're further down the socioeconomic pyramid. They are lower literacy, uh, lower literacy and lower digital literacy. How do you ensure that they can be brought on with both the kind of compelling killer app as well as with enough trust and security uh, so that they are able to do the things that we want them to do, including governance services, uh, digital payments, where they're entrusting their money to a digital uh, you know, framework which they don't understand at all. They understand paper, but we're trying to move them to digital. How do you make that happen? How do you take forward this enormous move toward a digital citizen identity while protecting citizen privacy, data, data flows, etc.? So this is broadly what we, and we will of course look at, uh, we have some great expertise on the panel from both India and the global side. And uh, I hope to be able to cover some of the global uh, case studies and best practices for India to look at and learn from, although India is, of course, very unique in terms of its scale of market where we are basically compared mostly with China. And those comparisons are also interesting, but uh, we'll maybe come to that. So could I uh, ask you, Ajay, to start with giving a very quick overview of uh, how you see the problem and where you think the focus should be? Uh, both from the government and policy side, as well as what we, the industry, could do. Yeah, thank you, uh, I think what we have here in I India. I think maybe is you could take this. It is on, but it is not as good as this one. Okay. So, uh, so thanks, uh, Prashanto. Uh, I think what we have in India today is a very interesting uh, uh, situation. Um, we actually have uh, built a fairly powerful uh, base of what we call uh, JAM. You know, getting everyone uh, into banking. Uh, almost everyone today has a Aadhaar number. We have more than a million, uh, more than a billion uh, uh, bank accounts more than a billion uh, uh, mobile uh, phone connections and uh, more than a mil billion, 1.18 uh, billion, 1.21 billion now, uh, Aadhaar uh, numbers that have been uh, issued. So that gives us an excellent platform and uh, the, the so-called uh, India stack, recently Mr. Satya Nadella also uh, referred to the India stack and the Aadhaar ecosystem and likened it to the kind of explosive growth that uh, we have seen with Facebook and with other uh, platforms. So this gives us an excellent base to start with. Now what we need to build on, as you mentioned uh, rightly, the very first thing that you require is to get everyone to be able to participate in the cyberspace, in, in all the in uh, getting access to, to the internet. So 
so far it is mobile um, uh, phone based access that has been moving very rapidly into our uh, uh, entire ecosystem but at the same time we have been uh, focusing on um, a bharatnet project uh, which is uh, aiming to take uh, uh, fiber to 250000 gram panchayats and then onwards to uh, to people and to homes in that actually there are some very interesting um, experiments that have already happened in india uh, i was actually personally involved in design and uh, roll out of one of them which is in the state of uh, andhra pradesh where we have used the bharatnet framework to actually extend it uh, to fiber to the home and uh, with the by taking fiber not necessarily underground but by using along the poles along the electricity poles uh, it is today possible and this is a project which is now operational in uh, in that state to actually take fiber to the home with an offering which includes cable which includes 250 digital channels which includes 15 mbps and all at 149 rupees a month which is 2 dollars and 25 cents so if if something like this can happen even at a slightly higher price point you know you have the potential and this is on demand and uh, i must say google uh, uh, you know we also have uh, some participation um, um, uh, by way of uh, some free space optics technology is being tried out and we do have technical possibilities that can actually help us take extremely high bandwidth to to homes it is when people get that kind of bandwidth in their homes and it is affordable that they actually start participating very actively so this i would say is a, is a high priority as we uh, make uh, strides in um, uh, completing our bharat net which in the first phase takes connectivity to the gram panchayats we have to work extremely hard to to shape up models which will take connectivity to homes to individual users and not just mobile based connectivity uh, a very uh, high uh, broadband uh, high bandwidth uh, uh, availability the second area where we have uh, we see a, a, a lot of uh, you know promise and it's early days uh, for that is uh, the area of uh, uh, you know digital payments through digital payments i think uh, the the demonetization uh, exercise that happened uh, about a year ago uh, reduced the amount of cash availability in the market and um, a lot of people actually a lot of new apps came up new payment service providers came up uh, uh mobile wallets came up both from banks and non banking entities and we have been building on top of that experience today and uh, uh, it's uh, you know from we set a very very ambitious target for uh, this year uh, from about uh, nine uh, uh, 900 crore which is about 9000 or 9 trillion transactions Uh, we wanted to reach uh, 25 trillion this year from 9 trillion last year and uh, i think a number of new platforms and ideas have emerged uh, in that uh, process new players have emerged the upi platform or the bhim platform which our pr prime minister uh, alluded to uh, this morning uh, the uh, the bharat qr code which is now taking shape so what we have in mind is to actually try to universalize the both the payment receiving infrastructure and payment infrastructure in the hands of payers get all merchants on to have payment acceptance infrastructure get all payers to have apps or mechanisms to be able to pay in a digital manner bring all billers on to a common platform in the country so that all of this is visible we simplify universalize and then popularize through a, by making it uh, worthwhile to use digital payments instead of 
uh, uh, cash payments. So this is one uh, uh, thing which is moving. Uh, you'll be, you know, one one uh, uh, small statistic I would like to mention that by in the month of uh, August we were actually having uh, the many many of our payment instruments are remain, remaining, uh, you know, where they where they were, or the growth is incremental. But we have new platforms today where. Uh, uh, in case of UPI, in August we were, and even in September, we were largely close to about 500,000 transactions per, per day. Then Uber joined the bandwagon, Ola joined the bandwagon, they, they enabled systems based on UPI, Flipkart through a, through a particular app joined the uh, same ecosystem and then Google also chose to actually bring out an app, this app, which is based on UPI. And by on 13th of November, we actually had 5.5 uh, million transactions, an 11-fold jump from where we were. We are now expecting that this will again um, grow, you know, it will sort of multiply. You, you should just see the, you know, week on week or month on month growth. Simultaneously, we are focusing on uh, bringing digital literacy to everyone. Right now, we are in the midst of a, a, a very large digital literacy project, which aims to uh, make uh, uh, 60 million uh, people in the rural areas uh, digitally literate, one from each family. So 60 million families is what we are intending to cover by next year. And we are, uh, uh, we are around, uh, I think we have completed uh, more, than the, uh, more than 10 million at present and this is going on, uh, going on well. And as a part of this, it's not just digital literacy, it's functional literacy. So they also get to know how to use uh, uh, mobiles for accessing uh, government services or for making digital payments and so on and so forth. Uh, yet another uh, area that I think we are uh, uh, keen on, keen on, uh, uh, on looking at and uh, promoting actively is, uh, you know, unlocking the potential that India has as such a huge uh, market. We, we have grown a, big story, you know, we have a huge story in information, in information technology, in information technology enabled services, and we have been providing a, a significant part of these services to, to places, you know, outside India. So uh, a lot of our business is built on uh, our ability to provide services uh, to almost every geography. There are still very large areas within India, very large markets within India where the same services have not yet reached fully. I think that is the next big area of growth, the rural BPOs. The rural BPOs will also get a tremendous fillip as we, we will also have to do simultaneously a lot of work in language enablement on, in cyberspace. Because it is, uh, if you look at um, uh, any particular uh, regional uh, area, say Karnataka, people, a large number of people will want services in Kannada language. So it is, it is the local entrepreneurs, it is local consumers, it is local businesses that really have to get into it, both language and, uh, you know, uh, the shifting our focus or putting a bit of our focus towards, uh, you know, serving our own unserved markets. We have a huge unserved or underserved market even today. That, I think, is, uh, can, can take us a, long, uh, a very long way. And uh, as the uh, existing markets uh, sort of saturate, I think we need to open up uh, the new markets within our country and uh, need to bring in skilling, startups, um, you know, Startup India, Stand Up India, and all those projects actually fit in with this. So these are some of my thoughts, initial thoughts.
I think you can take that back. Let's take it. Sorry about it. that. Some of the other minds are working for me. Okay, so I think that's, that's a lot of ground and I'd like to go back to you uh, after the first round with the speakers on some of those points, you know, especially, uh, so for example, you spoke about the FTTH uh, pilot that you've done. Uh, you know, the interesting point will be what are the kind of business models that can enable local entrepreneurs to take this up? Digital payments, you know, how do you address the cost of digital issue versus paper? But we'll come back to that. Marisa, can I come to you now? Uh, you know, we heard a lot of scale in Ajay, what, what Ajay was talking about in terms of India. India's numbers are always, uh, you know, very, very large. I think that is something that Google understands very well. You know, Google works very well with scale. Uh, I think it'd be very interesting to hear of your views and your, uh, you know, understanding of data governance and data privacy and security issues globally and see how they apply to India. And I know Google has been very closely involved in many of these legs, for instance, access. You know, he mentioned a couple of experiments. The Google Railtel project has been amazing, you know, taking high-speed uh, broadband to 100-plus railway stations in India. So Google has been very much at the heart of uh, this whole uh, thing of scaling up and capacity building with uh, internet access. So would love to hear your views, your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is it working? Uh, yes. I think you can try this. This is the best so far, so let's not risk it. So, so thank you very much. Um, I wanted to frame the discussion a little bit under the, the heading of the panel uh, that, that we're talking about, and that is how can we all facilitate uh, the, the growth or the boost of the digital economy? I mean, it is clear, I think, for all of us that the web, the app, uh, uh, and the, the, the apps, uh, social media, um, all of these technologies have uh, facilitated, has boosted sales of, of uh, companies, have increased productivity, and the internet really has lowered the barriers uh, to entry to many local businesses around the world. I mean, we have many stats that prove that in terms of GDP, in terms of how uh, uh, companies that go online have more revenues than companies that do not go online. And actually the internet is something that is, facil that is really boosting the economy um, and uh, the, the results of companies, both traditional and those companies that are uh, only online. So, so when we talk about the web and, and those, you know, it, it is very clear that it has had an impact on companies and organizations. I think we shouldn't stop here. The, the web has had enormous uh, influence and, and positive influence also on, uh, on individuals, on creators, on developers all around the world who can make a living by uh, using the internet and the possibilities that the internet um, uh, uh, favors them. Now, so if, if we know that the web uh, and, and the digital economy is, it has, been, uh, has boosted through uh, through the internet, both for companies and beneficiaries, what's the role of Google? So Google has created a series of, of tools, of products and services that are based uh, on the, the use of the internet as well and at, at the service both of, of users and, um, and, uh, and of companies alike. So what are the policies then, if we think that is a positive uh, thing, what are the policies that we should be uh, fostering both from the government and also from, from companies and NGOs uh, uh, in, in India, uh, but also are around the world. And the first thing really that comes to mind is um, how do we bridge the digital divide and how do we increase connectivity? At the end of the day, this is all about user empowerment. How do we foster the uh, use of languages? Uh, how do we get people connected? And in that case, you know, there has been mentioned already the work that Google is doing to provide a high-speed internet in railway stations. Also, the, our efforts to bring the internet and digital literacy to rural India through the SATI program, for instance. And also to cater and build products that, are, uh, to be, that can be used in, with low connectivity, like offline maps, or offline YouTube, or YouTube Go. So we need to cater, we need to adapt to the circumstances um, of the country. 
The next thing uh, that I wanted to mention, of, of course, is that is language. So you know that we have uh, Search, and Search is is our you know starring product. We organize the world's information and make it universally accessible. So we want the, the information to get to as many people as possible. But sometimes language is a problem, or uh, the reading is a problem. Literacy, for instance, the, the literacy uh, in a particular country like India, it is something to take into account. This is why it is so important to, I wanted to mention to you something like voice, uh, you know, a search through voice. Uh, since we um, are, you, uh, launched the Hindi as a language in, 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 in search, 28% uh, of the queries done in India are done in, in, in Hindi. And, you know, we want to make sure that people understand each other and can communicate um, in, in, in their own language. So we also launched our Indi uh, uh, keyboard where people can ask questions in the same language. So language is very important, connectivity getting to uh, rural India. The second element is uh, incentivizing entrepreneurship. And how do we do that? Well, India has the third largest startup uh, community. And we know from the OECD that these uh, you know, younger companies are the ones that uh, create uh, more employment. So what are, the, what are the three critic elements that think need to be fostered? First of all is financing, supporting these uh, uh, companies to get online. Second is skilling, right? You, yeah, you need to, create, you need to uh, um, provide the skills necessary. And the third thing is relationship and mentoring. So finance, skills, and uh, mentoring. The third element we can go into detail later on is data policies that favor data-driven innovation. And that's where privacy comes into place. Data-driven innovation represents uh, 10, billion, uh, uh, um, 10 billion US dollars in gross value added in India, and it's gonna grow uh, more than tenfold in, in the next years. So how do we support a data-driven innovation uh, policy? First of all, by uh, uh, supporting data flows. We cannot have a da innovation without data flowing. Uh, the second thing is to create a, a privacy baseline so we can see what, how that would be reflected or not in regulation. But pr a, a, a private use of privacy baseline is absolutely necessary for data innovation to flourish. Some people say that you should balance, make a balance between privacy and innovation. And I would tell you that is probably, I would adapt that sentence and say, you cannot have a pro data driven innovation co uh, country if you don't have good, uh, a good privacy baseline. So they go hand in hand, there's no need to do trade. Um, I'd like to probably discuss a little bit more some of these issues, but I'll stop here and to try to be brief. Thank you. Okay, again, I think a lot of interesting areas uh, have come up and I'd love to take up some of those, uh, especially in the context of the privacy baseline. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you very often hear this, this whole argument about privacy where uh, from the, uh, for example, we have this huge citizen identity thing that, ooh, it's, that's going to fall, okay. Um, and people say that, okay, citizens are worried about privacy, but you know, Facebook knows everything you do, Google knows everything you do. Uh, so, they would be very interesting to look at the, obviously these companies have a privacy policy. And uh, you know, uh, how, how does that compare with privacy policies that governments need to have, that countries need to have? We are in the process of a discussion about a privacy law. So, I'm going to come back to that question later. Devjani, can I come to you? Uh, you know, you, you're moving from a role where you've been looking at, uh, you know, uh, the techno uh, technology company which has been at the core of the market as it were. You know, uh, Intel, Microsoft, these companies were very much central to the market and therefore to the development and scaling of the market. In this, uh, and you're moving to an industry association where you'll have a chance to maybe scale that up in a different way. Uh, how do you see that problem having telescoped and expanded to a state where we are obviously well beyond the PC and you know uh, Windows Intel era, or we are well below beyond the PC era into the smartphone space where we're looking at a billion Indians who may have never seen a PC or at least 300, 400 million wouldn't have and they're going to use smartphones. So what are the policy issues that you think we are, we should be taking up as an industry side right now? Sure, can you hear me? Okay, wonderful. So thanks Prashant. The, I'm, I'm going to start by sharing a little bit of a personal experience, pretty much what uh, shaped my thinking about what the power of digital economy is. 
So I was involved, in fact, uh, with Mr. Dinesh Tyagi in Meiti uh, in a CSC project where we were working in 100 villages, in 100 CSCs, uh, to, to just take technology for the very first time to those villages and, and see what they would do with it. Right? And how could we get them to use it in a way that it impacted livelihood? That was the goal. Um, one of the villages I visited uh, completely changed my whole thinking perspective of digital India, the digital economy. It made me realize how real this is. So this village had 2,000 families. It was a minority community. Every single woman in that village had got trained by the VLE, who was also a lady, uh, they knew how to use the technology. They had been using it in pretty much on a daily basis. And they started doing things like creating pickle groups online and craft groups online. And it had directly impacted family livelihood, where they had started earning more. To me, that's transformation. And I was very curious as to how did it happen? How did she get 2,000 women to come and do this? And this VLE, and full credit to her, a very, very innovative young lady, uh, she told me that there was a problem that the village was facing, or rather the women were facing. The, there was the Jandhan Yojana program had just been rolled out. A lot of those families had opened bank accounts. The women, and no disrespect to the men here, but the women in that village did not trust what the husbands would do. They were very worried that the husbands would get their hands on that money and that money would vanish. So they were panicking and they needed a way to f ensure that the money was safe. So this lady saw that as an opportunity. And she went out family by family and told them that come, I will train you how to log in, how to use this magic device that's here so you can go and check whether the money is still there or not. Every day, they would turn up. They would turn up, they would check, they would be sure, and they would turn up twice. And then slowly, as they started getting com comfortable with the technology, she, she started teaching them other skills. Watching YouTube to learn how to make new pickles, watching, uh, learning other skills, and they were forming Facebook groups, and all sorts of things were happening. But to me, that was, you know, suddenly this whole concept of digital India became a reality. This is digital India. There's a direct connection between technology and livelihood. And how powerful is that? And I think that's what's most exciting about the times that we live in. You have this exponential rise in computing power. Uh, the smartphones today are doing what PCs did yesterday. So you have this exponential rise in computing power you have exponential rise in aspiration of people. And when these two come together, magic happens. And I think India is, that's what we are beginning to see in India. But there was also another learning from, for me in that experience. And that was, for all of this to happen, there are a few things that is critical, that must happen. And the first one, I think everyone talked about it, the, the secretary talked about it, the minister talked about it, but it is so true, the power of inclusion. Without that, digital India is not successful. And I think one thing we have to start doing much more proactively as a country is we have to encourage, especially the startup ecosystem, also the large companies, but I think the startup ecosystems are gonna be the front runners. We have to encourage them to design for inclusion. Not just the digital divide, the digital divide is huge, but also gender and others, other gaps that exist. But we have to encourage the ecosystem to design for inclusion. Okay, if you create something that will solve a problem in rural India, we as government will help you create that market. I think that is desperately needed and that is what's holding back a lot of people. Uh, we have to look at the CSC, I'm, I'm such a huge fan. I think, I think they, 
they, they are seriously connecting rural India to technology. I just, I just think we need to figure out how to leverage that much more. Just as the mobile phone penetration increases, and uh, but there's still a lot of innovation because it's not just the hardware, Prashanto. It's also the last mile access, as you and I have talked about several times. We have to encourage innovation there. It's not just the telcos that's going to solve that problem. Surely they'll be a large player. But I'm, again, I'm a strong believer that the Indian startup ecosystem will, can play a role there too. And there's a lot of innovation that is sort of bubbling up. We need to ensure how do we bring it up and make it real. But those are going to be critical. And then the second thing that I believe the second imperative for success is awareness. Not just digital literacy, as we call it, because I've honestly seen digital literacy programs that teaches people what's inside a computer. And you know, we, they don't need to know all that. They need to know how can we use this technology to earn more. That's as simple as that. So a lot of digital literacy is required, and they need to know that once they use the technology, how do they stay safe? I think those two things have to be addressed. Um, the third point, which you know, is a heated topic of debate today, the whole data privacy thing. I think it's important to have the right policies uh, with respect to data creation, consumption, and usage. It's, it's, not just, it's just not just one thing. We need to have the right checks and balances across the complete data management value chain, right from creation up to, up to consumption and sharing. And it should impact everyone from the user to the intermediaries to the companies that are using the data. But you know, all said and done, data is at the heart of digital India. If you do not share data, if you do not use data, there is no digital India. There is no benefit that we can get out of digital India. So data, data sharing is a must. The, what we have to figure out is how do we do it in a responsible way? How do we do it in a way that it benefits the citizens and not hurts them? And I think these are the three things, inclusion, awareness, and the data policy, which I think are absolutely critical to ensure we have a very robust framework uh, to get the maximum out of digital India. OK, great, thanks. Again, a lot of points to uh, take up further. Uh, let me take up from some of these things. Uh, Ajit, let me come to you. Uh, you know, we've, we've heard about access issues, uh, broadband, bandwidth. Uh, you're at the heart of, you know, content. You have the most uh, popular content app and platform and service around there. Uh, content is, is supposed to be the real big next big driver, okay? So far, if you look at internet adoption, the primary driver has been social networking, connectivity. The top three apps on a daily basis are uh, you know, WhatsApp, uh, Messenger, Facebook, whatever. And Hotstar is, I think, somewhere there in the top 10 now. Uh, I don't quite recall the current numbers. But uh, how do you make this happen for the next, you know, scale it up to the next 100, 200, 300 million, uh, where uh, access is, is a severe challenge. Access is all mobile. Uh, you know, you know we were, when we were talking earlier, you were mentioning Geo as an example of somebody who has actually scaled and brought multimedia, I mean, that's great. So, uh, you know, is that a model that you see working? So I'd like to hear from you first about your, you know, that content area, what are the regulatory, what are the challenges that you are facing and how do you see that scale and that scale as a driver of internet adoption for the next 300 million? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sandhu. Uh, I think before uh, specifically getting onto content, uh, for me, four things uh, in the context of our conversation uh, one, if you look at what's happening in India, the pace of growth in access to high quality data, where access to data is happening at a pace at the same time as there are innovative new uh, startups and service models coming up, and all happening in a democratic setup. It's pretty clear to me that the, the framework for creating policy for us will have to come from us. I don't think there are any easy answers from the world. I think there's a lot that we can learn from the world, but the context of the change that's happening in India, no one else has cracked it. I think it's up to us to put the different nuts and bolts of the policy framework uh, together, because our context is different and our velocity is dramatically different. Uh, and again, it's happening in a democratic setup. 
Uh, second, if, if I look at the last uh, three years, I think there's been tremendous work done by the government in putting together a very pr progressive framework for different parts of uh, policy related to different parts of the digital economy. And I think the private sector has played a, a, a very constructive role, especially in terms of the aggression in trying out business models and, and in making investments. But I think there's a huge opportunity for the private sector to do more in being a responsible partner to creating the policy framework. Uh, just as an example for me in, in the space that I come from in, in content, uh, I think clearly there's a lot more consciousness around content given what's happened around the world in the last 18 months. Uh, but for me, there is, you know, there is tremendous protection for many content platforms under the intermediary framework in India. Uh, I think it's time that content platforms take responsibility for the content that is on the platform. And, and for me, that's an example where I think the private sector can show up, especially in these early stages when different parts of the policy framework are coming into place. I think there's a tremendous role for the private sector to be a, a more responsible partner. And I think it extends to privacy as well, for example. Uh, I think most of the digital services today use permissions uh, for, for uh, seeking permissions from the user on location, or, or other parts of their attributes. Um, I think there's an interesting question in terms of what is the context in which these permissions can be leveraged. If one app seeks a permission and the user enables it, can they pass those attributes to another app in another context, even if it is uh, the ownership may be the same for the app? So I think there's a tremendous opportunity uh, for the private sector, which I believe has played a very constructive role to be uh, even more of a responsible partner. I think the third point for me is, and, and I think this is to the question that you asked, uh, I don't think there is any confusion uh, that the more people come online, the more the benefits roll up for individuals as well as for the country in terms of skills, in terms of access to information, new opportunities. Um, we have a slightly different theory in terms of what will it take to get people online. Uh, and especially at Hotstar, our belief is that video can be the use case for bringing people online. We believe that Hotstar can be the primary use case for bringing a billion people online because the nature of the content that we have, whether it's a television show people have been familiar with, whether it's movies or a cricket uh, match, it transcends language barriers. There is ease of access. Uh, they're familiar with the content. So it, it's quite possible that once they come online, the, the value comes from you know, payments, reducing the cost of the cash economy, access to skill, but the next layer above affordable access to broadband for us is there's an enormous power to use the power of video to bring people online. And then when you marry the power of video and education, I think it can be taken to an entirely uh, entirely uh, new level. And I think the last point for me, again, you know, sitting in Hotstar in terms of some of the work that we do, there's a tremendous opportunity to build great products that are made in India, made for India, but made for the world as well. I, I want to give an example. One of the big algorithmic challenges we are facing now is, uh, given the range of content that we have, uh, we have nine languages, we have content that appeals to the most affluent urban India as well as rural India. It's TV shows, it's cricket. How do we match the right users to the right content without even asking users for explicit preferences? Now, if you're able to crack that problem, that answer is relevant in other sectors in India. It's relevant for uh, the world beyond India. So for me, what is exciting about what we are all doing is, I think it's moved away from India is no more the back offshore engine uh, for great products that are built elsewhere. Uh, I think there's a tremendous market here, but some of the problems that we are trying to solve are so interesting and so complex, solving them opens up access for markets everywhere, but the problem has been cracked in India. Okay, thank you so much. That's, that's a lot of food for thought and you know uh, the discussion on 
taking responsibility for uh, own content itself can get into a full uh, day long debate uh, but we'll see if we have time for some of those the context one was again a very very key thing that you mentioned and i think that's very fundamental to uh, privacy to uh, you know how data is used and what purpose it's taken for and what else it's used for uh, William, thank you for listening patiently. I wanted to come to you last because I wanted you to get a perspective on what are the issues that are here and uh, apply it through the lens of your very considerable global experience, you know, of Japan and you consult to the governments of the UK and Singapore. And, uh, you know, if you, if you start with, for example, the citizen identity thing that we have gone into and we, are, uh, go, we have taken a very, very big jump into a complete, you know, 1.2 billion database, which is now being applied to various services from direct benefit transfer, etc. What, what are some of the global practices, especially, uh, you know, in Japan, UK, Singapore, you're used to, in terms of citizen identity and how that is done, how that is uh, pushed or pulled, uh, how that is leveraged? Now, uh, thank you for that uh, question. It's, a, it's really an honor and pleasure to be here, not only because it's new, and it's uncharted. But let me uh, frame this. I'm, I'm, I'm very envious, listen to all the other panelists um, and Mr. Secretary on these issues, uh, that India is unencumbered. It doesn't have legacy systems to worry about. It goes straight into mobile for 1.2 billion people. That, let me change your question a little bit, that one of the probably issues that one should be careful about when I go around and look at these countries and such is that because you're starting out so new, the worst thing you could do is to copy some of these legacy issues because frankly I think we're at a inflection point with cybersecurity where the things that we have been doing up to now have been an old paradigm where we're adding security after the fact and we have a lot of issues in the world today including this untenable privacy and, and, and so on that we talk about often. I think going forward because you have such a clean model to work from in a mobile context, you need to, I think, look at not just what the other country is experiencing, but also look at the second order effects and third order effects. And what I mean by this is, I realize and I understand that getting people connected onto the internet is very important, for example. But looking around the world, it's a fact that the internet, whether you're connected or not, has affected every single human being on the planet whether through supply chain or through efficiencies of markets, but there are many of these areas. And so I think one should definitely not forget about that area. There was issues or points about made about private industry and, and, and companies coming on board to do this. I think that's a key point. Today, the internet, 94% of it is run on private, in, private businesses. And so if you think about it, to create the incentive mechanism so that you pull in industries where you may have the last mile unconnected, uh, it is a fact to see evolutions of other countries in developments that if you create the incentive mechanism in such a way, businesses will come and create that system so that it pulls the rest of the population uh, ahead on that. But I think the other aspect that one should definitely not forget when we talk about things like privacy and, and, and authentication and biometrics and stuff is we tend to, especially listen to these conversations, look at it just from the human vantage point. And one of the key points that I would like to point out, especially in a mobile society, is that the cell phones that the average Indian carries now has 14 sensors. These 14 sensors just 15 years ago would have cost you a quarter million dollars to carry around and it would have been the size of a house. And now we carry it in the back of our pockets. This is changing the world phenomenally, but even this one example as a society, as a government, as an industry, as humans, we need to look at. We need to extend everything from privacy debates to the merits and the advantages that this provides. Because for the first time in human history, these 14 sensors redefine what information, what data is. We talk about this, but we tend to talk about this in the human context. And so I think that now is the time, especially if you have this clean slate, to expand that out and understand that for the first time in human history, data is now being created by non-human entities. That up to now, it's always been humans that entered this, that modified this, that calculated this. But now we're creating 24 by seven, 365 days a year, we're getting this data and this has implications good and bad for society. And so I think that these are the added, added advantages that you have as a pure mobile society in terms of the benefits that you provide, 
where I believe firmly that private industry will pull in the rest that are unconnected because you have to have the sustainable. Unfortunately, my also looking around the world and looking at governments, governments are very bad at pushing apps down to the population. And I don't think that's government's role. But I think that private industry plays a role in here to create the value add and to create the sustainability so that we help out government, that it's not just government's burden, and we balance this out. And so I think uh, listening to all the various conversations, my additive part right there is what the context and what the meaning of data is, how it's redefining privacy, and, and what really are the advantages for this where I think like some of the speakers pointed out, it's the private businesses that really have to pull up this, and the government's role is really to create that environment for them to prosper. Thanks very much. So what we'll do is uh, we'll just have a, uh, maybe a quick uh, few uh, bits of interaction on some of the points that came up, and we'll take in a few questions to add into the interaction. So let me, uh, you know, we've covered a lot of ground here. Uh, We've had some very good examples of what is what is happening both in India and outside. Uh, you know, if we if we take a look at uh, some of the real uh, success stories in scale, and uh, you know, so uh, I mean, there, of course, the Bharatnet project itself and the many pilots around it, uh, the the Google project, which has taken Wi-Fi to you know 100 plus railway stations. Uh, we spoke about Geo, uh, you know, that is a pure private sector. Uh, you know, example of enormous scale and they've added 100 million. So, you know, you've had a pretty good mix. Uh, Ajay, if I were to put it to you from the industry, what do you, what is it that you would, you think the industry can do in really helping scale up? One obviously is to actually identify a business model and uh, offer a compelling service so 100 million people take it up, which, which is very rare and there are very rare examples of companies who are able to do that. Uh, if you were able to, and this is something I'd like to put to the rest of you too, that uh, are there good examples of things that the industry can do in helping scale up and getting the next 300, 400 million people online? Which, by the way, is something not just the government of India wanting to do, but Google wants to do that, Facebook wants to do that. Everybody wants to get the you know, next 300, 400 million people in India online because they will be users of their service. And I'd like to then extend that question to, uh, you know, uh, Marisa, you too, uh, and, you know, take a look at uh, it from the data security and privacy point of view. Uh, and especially, you know, let, let me place the question to you so you can seamlessly take over. That if you look at uh, uh, privacy, and, you know, people often say, like I mentioned briefly a little while ago, that uh, we talk about privacy and you're reluctant about giving data to government, but, uh, you know, Google and Facebook know everything we do. Uh, so it's interesting, is it that citizens or users uh, trust some corporations a lot more than they trust governments, or is, it, is there something that governments can learn from the corporations which are actually using such a lot of citizen data? Maybe they're doing it responsibly, maybe there's a, a privacy policy or something. What would be the learnings from that? So, uh, Ajay, first to you, on the industry engagement and what you think industry could do. I think before that, before that, I would also like to respond to one or two points that were made uh, by our panelists. One about uh, data privacy and uh, you know the data protection and the confidence. Uh, I think government of India is actually working uh, very seriously to bring out a data protection framework, and we currently have a committee uh, working on that. And. Uh, Models have emerged from across the world, uh, for instance, GDPR in uh, Europe and uh, uh, Australia, Singapore, many other countries have models of data protection. So we are working on that and possibly in the first half of uh, next year we should see uh, uh, data protection and data privacy uh, issues, uh, uh, you know, the framework becoming very clear as to what are the responsibilities, what kind of a consent is required. Uh, by uh, entities that uh, handle uh, people's uh, personally identifiable data, what they can do with it, and uh, you know uh, what kind of consent is required uh, for that. What are the limitations of consent? Sorry, can you just bring this a bit closer? Yeah. So uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, one area. Uh, in uh, many of our uh, government uh, systems, we have been now generating a humongous amount of uh, data and uh, through open data policies and uh, 
in uh, most of our systems, we are also promoting open APIs. So those again create uh, a tremendous scope for uh, entrepreneurs, startups to actually uh, have access to data. As we start generating a very large amount of data on digital uh, payments, we expect a completely new segment of flow-based credit also to emerge. Uh, you know, one of the areas where we see a very large scope uh, is uh, flow-based credit. Not, not The formal channels of credit uh, normally elude uh, small uh, uh, businesses and uh, uh, entities. So uh, a new sort of uh, opening could be made in that direction. But the largest, um, I think, uh, one in the area of uh, uh, content, entertainment, uh, is what uh, Ajit had also uh, referred to, video content. Video content can actually help us make uh, serious inroads uh, uh, into healthcare, into education, into skilling, and almost in every, every single uh, uh, sector of uh, activity. Um, I think uh, helping uh, uh, startups uh, in in those areas is a, is a major uh, uh, area of focus for us. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so, um, Marisa, uh, on this point, and in fact, let me also extend. Uh, Ajit mentioned context. Uh, context is obviously very important. Is uh, is that an area that you think governments can actually learn from corporations in terms of clarity of context? Not necessarily all corporations, but where there is a lot of trust from users in terms of their data. And is it that the context is clearer that data will be used for this? And various with governments, it's a little fuzzier that you know, you're not sure what all it can be used for. Right, I think, that, uh, I think that's right. I think that context is, is, extremely, is extremely important, sometimes very difficult to include in frameworks. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's something that should always define the debates. I think that for uh, the private sector, it has been really important that if, if our innovation is based on data, it is important that our users trust what we do with our data. So one of the challenges that we have is as, as global companies, we want to serve our users in the same way, and therefore we have our baseline privacy principles that we apply around the world because we don't want to treat citizens in a different in a different fashion. However, privacy frameworks are different, and sometimes they have to be because, as you we talked about context, we talk about how uh, you know India is in a very different position than the uh, European Union is in terms of the amount of uh, users online, in terms uh, of digital literacy, uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the user trust, uh, the relationship between the user and companies, and the relationship between users and, and governments. So it, I think that it's when we talk about privacy frameworks, it's important to create a culture of privacy. And the creation of a culture of privacy is no, no to your point about responsibility of before of, of companies and all, it, it's, it's not something that is only for companies to deliver or for users, for the government. We need to do this together. And the first component is when we get people online, how do we do that? How do we make sure that uh, we, uh, we incite people to go online, so they're not worried about this. So what does actually digital literacy mean? So camp awareness campaigns, so just gonna give you an example of something that Google is doing. We are currently uh, developing a, a campaign uh, with the government in India to raise awareness on how to use the internet and how to do it in a secure, in a secure manner. And we're doing it with the Ministry of, of Consumer Affairs. We need to do mm, a lot more of these, uh, of these things together. Um, it, it, and, and, and to be very, you know, to be very, very precise on, on the word context, the, each, the baseline principles of privacy of why do I want data, how do I use data, how do I share it, for what purpose do I share it, those principles, you can find it around the world, and they are common principles, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a common trend. The question is, how do you make that, how do you put that in a framework that actually responds to the challenges or to the, the circumstances of, of a particular country? And you are going to have that debate, you are having that debate um, 
And my plea is, as it was also mentioned before, let's not copy. Uh, the, 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 uh, privacy frameworks need to be alive, need to be relevant to, to your users, to your citizens. Don't copy regimes uh, that were not made for your country, but look at how to make a user-centric uh, uh, framework that will make sure that your citizens go online when you need them to and that are that are, that are happy to go to uh, to the products and services that, that we offer them. This baseline you're saying around the world, this is for typically a corporation or some of the large corporations. Because privacy policies, of course, may vary tremendously from government to government. And you have bumped into EU's policies, Germany's policies, right to be forgotten, etc. So what you're saying is there's a baseline that you follow and you may have to adapt to countries uh, depending on what they have in place, if they have anything. Yes, and there's some principles that actually are universal. So another thing that I, that I wanted to bring is we need to start bringing privacy outside of privacy policies, privacy outside of the legalese, and make them something meaningful for people. Uh, and companies, you know, global companies like mine are uh, putting a lot of effort on that, but the, 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 the government should also look into that. How do, we, how do we talk about privacy in a way that people understand? Do we use, someone was mentioning video, that's a great point. Uh, what about voice? Making sure that people can ask questions and get answers in a way that they actually understand. There's a, like the, the woman, to your point, the woman in rural India is not the same as the urban gentleman here. We talk also about, about gender inequalities. So there are many things that, we, that are about the how as opposed to looking at specific restrictions uh, and legal concepts. So let's, privacy should not be a legal thing. Uh, Ajit, you had a point. Yeah. Do you also have something to add, William? Okay, I'll just come to you very quickly, both of you, and then I'll take some questions. Yeah, just I think uh, to both the points that you mentioned uh, about access and trust, uh, I, I must confess I'm a bit old-fashioned on this. On the access point, uh, I do think uh, the most exciting thing would be if the private sector has an incentive to make big investments to expand access dramatically. And, and I think that's what has happened uh, with at least one telecom operator, right? Uh, and for me, you know, it, it's good for us to do multiple experiments, but my belief is expanding access to a billion people won't come on the back of uh, CSR initiatives on the side. I think it will happen on the back of uh, companies saying we want to make the investment because we see a business model here. And, and I think we have already seen uh, the tremendous impact of at least one company, which moved 4G from zero to 100 million in no time. I think for me, it'll be exciting if someone does that in fixed line broadband. Uh, but I think that's one. Uh, on the question of trust, uh, again, a bit old fashioned, I wouldn't leave it to trust. Uh, I don't think it's a question of, do I trust one company over another company? I think it's good for us uh, as a society, uh, especially between uh, the government, the citizens, and the, and the private sector to agree that we are going to play by a set of rules or principles that we have collectively agreed. I, I think I'm skeptical of leaving it to, you know, let's, let's just hope that they trust some private companies more than others. Yeah, William, very quickly. So there are a couple of words that were brought up here uh, that I would be a little bit wary to, and, and to put it in context, I, I, I tell the story often and, and give talks on this, that I've been doing this for, I've been doing cybersecurity for a quarter century, and you could see these changes. But 10 years ago, when you spoke at an audience like this, the majority industries, the world's largest industries by valuation were uh, oil-based. And what's often discussed now is in 2017, the five largest companies on the planet now are all IT-based. And so the discussion here that we talk about is that data is now the new oil. And this brings up a number of issues that we're clearly in a network world. We would not be having these vigorous privacy discussions and so on unless we were networked. That the damage is much greater now because we are networked and so on. And so I caution when we talk about these things in very limited sound bites and stuff because words like privacy and things like trust are actually a term of art that really depend on the context that you're from. And so I wouldn't paint yourself in that corner uh, or else you could have uh, very huge ramifications. And I'll give you an example that 
the Asian culture's approach to privacy and frameworks and laws are clearly different from Western cultures when I have these discussions. That if you have laws uh, that talk about X, call it privacy, call it monetary policy, whatever, the Asian cultures tend to go, okay, how do we abide by this and not get in trouble? Whereas the Western culture, we would have the same arguments and everybody is speaking the same ways. The, the thinking is, how do we work around this so that we get the benefits from this? And if you look at this, there is a big difference in what I just said about valuation and companies because in many cultures that look at privacy and frameworks in a negative way, they inhibit themselves. They look at personally identifiable information as radioactive, that you can't touch it. And none of the governments are saying that. But you're definitely hurting innovation and businesses and such to take advantage of this, to create new businesses, use artificial intelligence, big data, and, and uh, machine learning if you don't have that data. Whereas if you take the broader look at this and go, okay, how do we look at this within the regime and look at this, it becomes very important when you define these things that the cultural interpretation for these uh, terms of art uh, are very critical to not only the near but medium future. Okay, great. We have five minutes, so I'm going to quickly take two or three questions and then uh, we've got questions from uh, back there. Uh, okay, so can we actually, uh, do we have a way to get a mic back there? Uh, you have a mic already, so you could start that. Can we have one more mic back there to the, I think, lady who stood up there? And then you can start and we'll come to you. Yeah. Yes, so very quickly because we are very tight on time. I'll yeah, take absolutely. three questions together. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'm General Sani. I've just got two questions to ask. One is, of course, uh, what Google is doing in these 100 stations that you have put up the Railtel project. Uh, what are the policy guidelines given for data mining, data analytics, use and misuse of this data that would flow out of the number of people who get connected to you? I mean, is there a policy directive on that? The second issue which I would like to look at is uh, what he talked about, that we are at an inflection point as far as security of systems are concerned. So today, uh, having applications, having systems and uh, uh, processes, and thereafter adding the security paradigm on it is, is, is really a very, very expensive way of doing things. And nowhere do we hear about policies which are talking about forcing the guys who are manufacturing oblique, who are actually the innovators of these applications, to include the security issues right at the inception stage. I think India is moving exactly what he said into a news field very, very fast, very automatically, where there is a very uneducated uh, 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 population which would be handling it. So I think security issues in the applications right at the inception stage should become a policy directive to make sure that there are no losses. And this is where I think the point which William said was extremely good. Maybe comments on both of these. Okay. Uh, clearly, I mean, no argument with the second uh, one. Just uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. I just uh, want to mention that the whole event is uh, connected to 28 uh, locations all over the world. And one of the participants has text messaged uh, the question that uh, how our policies takes into account the inclusion in transforming cities into smart cities. Uh, what was the, in uh, I've missed a few words. Uh, smart cities I got, what was the connecting question? Um, policies which are How our policies takes into account the inclusion in transforming cities into smart cities? Inclusion in transforming. Okay, fine. Let's let's park that question. I want to just take that uh, lady out there. If you can quickly frame your question, and then we'll take all of them together. <clears throat> uh, go ahead. Uh, do you have a mic? Oh, can you come forward then, maybe? Uh, okay. So while she does that, maybe we can just quickly take this up. Uh, do you want to quickly address this? Are you aware of the data policies you're using in terms of? user data being collected for the Google Railtel project? So, so my understanding, I mean, I, I, I have a, a, a basic understanding of this. I have my colleagues from Google India as well, but what, I'm, uh, what, what I believe is that our work or our, poli our work in extending uh, Wi-Fi connectivity uh, to, to railway stations in no way is related to a possibility for data mining or, or data analytics. I would like, if, if that is not the case, I like my, I see that that is the case. So let's not confuse the things. Obviously, we do have very strong, robust policies on how uh, we analyze data, but in this case, uh, this one, 
this initiative is not linked to our ability to, uh, to analyze data. It's simply about giving access um, or extending connectivity to users in India. Okay, uh, are we ready with this, uh, the lady's question here? Is she come for with a mic? Okay, she's not there. All right, so let's uh, take the lady here. Do you have a mic? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Chavi from IIT Delhi. My question is that uh, when we have search engines like DuckDuckGo, they give us their privacy policies or how uh, the user policy in just five simple bullet points. But when we talk about other search engines, especially Google being the major one, when a user is supposed to sign a policy agreement or a privacy policy, whatever they're tracking, we, it is such a tedious agreement that many a times we would not read what the app is actually offering and just, you know, say accept and start using those applications. Why can't tech companies just give us five simple frameworks, uh, frameworks such as uh, engines, which, uh, such as DuckDuckGo, which is doing? So, okay, this is, this is uh, I think, interesting, and I'd like to also address it uh, to the others. Uh, especially with the context of low literacy, next 300 million taking it up, how do you communicate privacy policy to these people? When you say accept, uh, I mean, I don't read terms and conditions, so uh, I'm not sure how, uh, does anybody have a thought on how to do this? Uh, or I think that was addressed to you, but it's open. William, have you tackled this issue? Uh, I don't know if you have uh, faced uh, this kind of scale of problem that is, is there in India in terms of hundreds of millions of fairly low literacy users to whom you're trying to communicate a privacy policy, but maybe some context or example of that. Devjani, anybody? Yeah, I, I think uh, to, to, to the, the last question, uh, I largely agree with the principle that she's stating, which is uh, the, the, whether it's data policy or privacy policy should be easily understood and easy to access. Uh, and, and I think especially in the tech world, it's not difficult to solve it. And, and I think it's a call, uh, not just to Google, I think it, it's true for uh, services across the board. I think we can all do better in terms of raising the bar on being a lot more overt about, you know, telling the consumer what is it that we're asking for, why, and, and I think I, I definitely agree with the principle there and I think all of us in the in the tech world can do a much better job of it. Yeah, uh, I think that there has been an evolution. Uh, there, there has been an evolution in the way that we present privacy to to our users, and this is something that I tried to explain before. Um, it, 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 you know, if if you think about ad settings um, and how people could control their preferences online at Google in 2009, if you compare it to the way that it works today, it is, you would agree with me that there has been a phenomenal change. Uh, what does really transparency mean? How do we communicate with our users? Uh, it, 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 and that's what I was saying before. How do we get out of boxes where you say, yes, I agree to 10 pages? And how do we do on time, unreal, so on time, contextual notices to people in the language that they understand. This is why it's so important to get, as I was saying before, privacy out of legal discussions and into the, you know, communications and bringing marketing experts that can help us, you know, communicate and interact better with users. And I think that the, the road is not, you know, not everything is done. We continue to innovate, we continue to challenge ourselves every day. So nothing is, is perfect, um, but it is an area of, of, of uh, you know, of, of not great concern, of, but of great interest uh, at Google. You know, one uh, suggestion that had come to us, and I'll come to you, Devjani, in some previous discussion like this, is color code privacy agreements where you, uh, on an agreed framework, you it's green if it's run of the mill, red if it's something that you need to watch out for. In an app, if the app is seeking camera and mic permissions, flag it red, you know, stuff like that. So that's an interesting idea where the end user sees a red, green, blue, violet, whatever. Uh, Devjani. No, and I think that's a fabulous idea, but all said and done, I do think that there is a need for a mindset change at even the user, on the, on the side of the users. Because just as we want governments to be open, transparent, and we believe that technology is gonna drive that, technology is also gonna do the same for society. 
It's a, it's a great equalizer. It's going to create an open, transparent society where data, and the reason you, you heard William say data is the new oil, and we've all heard this, data is the oil, data is the gold. Why are we saying this? Because data today is the most valuable thing. And we have to realize it. So I don't, it can be simplified, but I really don't know to what extent it can be simplified given the value that data has today. It is tremendously valuable. Your data, my data, it is valuable. We have to understand that. And we have to figure out how do we protect what is, what is sensitive because not all data is sensitive and sharing data helps because it allows us to get services much better than before. So sharing data is absolutely needed in this economy, but there is sensitive data which you should not be sharing, or which, which, and I think that I honestly believe is not just, the onus is not just on the government or on the companies to simplify privacy guidelines or whatever and ask. I also believe that the society has to evolve a bit and the mindset has to change. Uh, if we want an open, transparent ecosystem, economy, we are part of it. And we have to accept that. So I, I, I do believe that change is also needed. Okay, so uh, William, I'll come to you. I'm just wondering if we have a few more minutes because we are actually officially four minutes over the original time, but we started 20 minutes late. So if uh, I can take, maybe there are lots of hands up. Uh, My question can is we very quickly, and William, I will I'll let you respond to. Okay, so I'm, I'm taking this as a, as a yes. Uh, go ahead, sir. I've secretary. seen this hand up first. And there, okay. So let's take, go ahead very quickly. Please, yeah. we're completely uh, out of time. And I'll come to you then. My question is why governments are not thinking for having a regulator who will vet or approve the privacy policy of the corporates because a citizen does not know. Like we have a telecom regulator who basically vets the tariff, etc., and it can take the complaints of citizens. Okay. Similarly, sh should we not have the regulator for the private privacy policy? Okay. We'll just park this question, take that question too. Hi, my name is Vidya and I'm from Mail today. I have two questions for the IT secretary. One is that Uber has just disclosed around 57 million accounts of theirs have been hacked. Uh, across the globe, if you see Australia, the UK and uh, regulators I'm, from I'm those I'm sorry, you'll just have to repeat that. I think we missed this. Just, just repeat that a little slowly. Okay. So Uber has just disclosed that 57 million accounts have been hacked on their platform okay. across the globe. So uh, regulators from the UK and Australia are uh, pressing Uber to look into the issue to find out what's happening. I want to uh, understand what India is doing to find out how many of, in, of the Indian accounts have been affected. And uh, the second question is that the government is set to come out with a, uh, a cyber security guideline for mobile devices. Uh, this is supposed to come out in February, I believe, and so I'd like to know what is the contour, contour of it and where is it headed and what is the status of it. Thank okay, you. so what we'll do is we'll quickly take these up and maybe uh, Ajay, you could lead off answering this and if you'd also like to take up the smart city question which came in, uh, you know, where I think it was basically that uh, are we have, do we have policies which are helping inclusion in the uh, smart city? I'm not very sure of that question, but uh, then there's this question about uh, a regulator for privacy. Now you do have a data security committee set up in Meti, which so maybe that could you, you could touch upon that. And William, I'll come to you next. Yeah. So, so, uh, go ahead. Uh, Ajay, go ahead. Start. Uh, on the issue of uh, uh, you know the uh, security breaches that uh, happen now and again um, uh, relating to individually identifiable data of uh, users that is available with a large service provider like uh, say Uber. Um, I think the, these are uh, pointers to, uh, to, uh, an, uh, you know, to a growing uh, issue and sometimes in fact uh, it is said that uh, almost any any data is penetrated. It's only whether you know it today or not. That much apprehension is there of the kind of uh, advances that uh, hackers are uh, making. And so the very first uh, question is, um, you know, strengthening of uh, cybersecurity, which I, I believe that all the uh, companies are uh, always uh, uh, sort of concentrating on. And it's, it's not just, uh, companies alone that would be able to do that. 
the clarity on protection of uh, of data which you hold in trust i think is uh, going to be uh, quite essential in this and as we move forward uh, what is it that you can do with data uh, simplifying the communication to the person whose data is involved moving from just consent you know sometimes we just uh, go through uh, 30 pages of tightly written um, uh, text and then say i agree without that you cannot proceed further but uh, nuanced consent consent which is for a particular purpose holding of data not just a one time consent forever so holding of uh, data uh, is in you are holding it in trust you are holding it for a particular purpose and we need to move to a system where consent is given for a for a particular purpose and the time for which time frame and the purpose for which the consent is given data has to necessarily be used only for that and then it has to be held in a uh, secure manner so the norms for security are getting tightened and india would also be uh, participating in this uh, process on the smart cities question um, i think many of the projects being taken up in uh, smart cities involve uh, deepening of uh, access uh, providing very new range of uh, uh, electronic services to everyone also including uh, of course they include several other things like uh, improved transportation services uh, and uh, uh, the deployment of uh, uh, a number of uh, uh, e governance uh, services as well municipal services making them available in a simple manner so uh, in a way the smart cities uh, framework is uh, moving in that direction i i'd also like to add that oh, the smart I city have... process started with a consultative framework and that was an absolute essential part of the run up to the smart city evaluation that you had to have citizen consultations yes, and sir. that happened across many cities beyond the final ones which were smart cities i have been told that we are well over i have over a the question please before you wind up i've been waiting for a while um, thank you okay uh, you'll have to be very quick because Thanks we are 10 minutes over time uh, my question is to the japanese gentleman dr william uh, my name is tripti nath and i work for uh, the asahi shimbun uh, and you don't need an introduction to that i just want to know to what extent is india's emergence as a digital economy contributing to growing japanese investments in india i was in gujarat before uh, mr abe's visit and i was given to understand that from two japanese companies i think in 2002 when mr yagi was the ambassador here the number is now almost touching 100 Okay so uh, this is a little outside the remit of this panel but if you have a very short answer to that but you also had something you wanted to say so I'll let you have the last words and then we completely need to wrap up go ahead sure. william sure so let me try to answer the last five questions in one minute here uh to your point yes i think the bilateral relationship between japan and india is very critical because there is actually a lack of program capacity in japan and so the programming capabilities of india have been helping a lot of japanese companies and that's only increasing so i think that's a good thing now to the other questions uh, i think that the the scariest thing next to hackers in the cybersecurity world are is a term uh, are, are a group of people called lawyers and and so this is actually very important because even words that we take for granted things like digital cyber ict internet these all mean different things for 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 lawyers to pick at and so it's not just the uh, companies themselves to protect themselves but it's really uh the consumers who also sue and so it's how you create these regulatory environments so japan's a good example where we have recently created something called a regulatory sandbox which allows for innovation to occur and if you do make a mistake which might happen you don't get sued to death uh and then i think through this point which is very important to the, la the the very first question about how security is an inflection point i think it's very very important that if you think about the mobile world that you live in You have an opportunity here to change what is frankly a messed up cybersecurity world today that we actually as an industry place the burden of security on the end user. And this is crazy and unique. The example that I would give is that you would go buy a car from a dealer and the dealer would then tell you go to an airbag company here and buy an airbag and then a seatbelt company here and buy a seatbelt after the fact. 
And so I think really India, because of its unique position, it could change this because you have lots of incoming population, or in the case of Japan, an elderly population that can't memorize a 20-digit password and change it every week. That we have these burdens where these old methods, paradigms, legal regimes and stuff can be out the door. Thanks very much. And uh, I, I know there were a lot of other questions. I apologize. We have to completely wrap up. Uh, thank you all for your participation. We've had a fairly uh, wide-ranging discussion on a very, very hot and happening area. I think you're going to see uh, Digital India taking off on a number of fronts. Uh, we've seen that activity, that uh, heated excitement in the market now, whether it's digital payments or access, uh, telecom, all of it. Uh, I, I, I do believe that you know a, a lot of the ideas which have come up here uh, and a lot of the examples suggest that we, industry and uh, government, will be working together on making this happen. Thank you all very much and Thank back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And as a token of our um, affection and to honor our guest speakers, we want to present them mementos. And I would like to request Seema Chaudhary, uh, economic advisor, to please come up onto the desk and present a memento to Prashant Roy first. He uh, is the moderator. He was the moderator for this session. Thank you. And the memento to uh, respected Marisa Martin. Now, Mr. S.K. Srivastava, Director in the Ministry of Electronics and IT, uh, I would like to request you to please come up onto the desk and uh, present memento to Dr. William Saito. Respected Dr. William Saito, our guest from Japan. And uh, Mr. S. K. Srivastava will present memento again uh, to Mr. Ajay Sahani, Secretary in the Ministry. Now I would call upon Neeraj Agrawal, Director NEGD and TIC to present memento to respect Mr. Ajit Mohan. Now the memento to Devjani Ghosh, our respected speaker, guest speaker on the desk. Thank you so much. Good luck. Namaskar. <laughs>